introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce Derek Gregory, who's a Peter Ward Distinguished Professor at um, British Columbia. Uh, his research uh, is just extraordinary about spatial modalities of late modern war and um, the, the great book, The Colonial Present, um, Afghanistan, Palestine, Iraq, from 2004. He's got some five projects, uh, uh, which include Killing Space, Deadly Embrace, War and Distance and Intimacy, War Material, uh, and uh, is, is particular um, uh, interest in, uh, in the g global war uh, and space. Um, the, um, <coughs> if you don't know his extraordinary uh, blog space, uh, Geographical Imaginations, Wars, Spaces and Bodies, do go there today. It is like the, the most extraordinary resource uh, uh, about militarization that I think exists out there. It's a very, very important intervention uh, in, in our culture and about global, not only cultural geography, but, but the military world we live in. Please welcome Derek Gregory. Thank you. <laughs> Excuse me as I fight my way into the ground control station. Um, firstly, thank you so much for inviting me. It really is a pleasure to be here and thank you all for coming. I've been in two minds over this talk, partly about what to call it, under African skies or equally under American eyes. They are two sides of the same counterfeit coin. But I've been in two minds too, because what I want to talk about is a very particular so-called signature strike, which has dominated so much discussion of remote warfare. I've written about it in the past, indeed I've blogged about it, but for the final chapter of my new book, Reach from the Sky, I've revisited it. It's always a mistake to do that, I think, except this time it's thrown up a whole series of new questions and I hope new answers which I want to share with you today. But first of all, some necessary preliminaries so that you understand the larger project. The first point I want to make is that drones today seem to be everywhere. Here we are in Saudi Arabia. Here we are in Colorado. And here we are in Iraq. And yet, even as drones seem to be everywhere, they are not. Now, most of my work focuses on American military violence, with some excursions into British, Russian, and inevitably Israeli violence. But holding my focus on American military violence, it's important to understand that today's drones are not everywhere, and they cannot be, because as General Mike Hostage realised in 2013, they can only be used in permissive, which is to say uncontested airspace. So it shouldn't surprise you to learn that if we look at the US Air Force's current inventory, 6% of its current strike inventory is composed of drones. It's plateaued at that level. And the reason is that the Pentagon is preoccupied, when it's not preoccupied with Donald Trump, with China and Russia. You can use drones over Donald Trump, but you certainly can't use them over Russia and China. All of which is to say that drones come into their own in uncontested airspace. Uncontested by virtue of air supremacy over Afghanistan, Somalia and Yemen, and indeed Gaza through covert agreement and cooperation, as with the drone strikes over Pakistan's federally administered tribal areas, or through deconfliction, as with Russia over Syria. But that isn't to say that drones aren't important. Of course, drones have carried out virtually 100% of all targeted killings in Pakistan's borderlands. But even there, we need to understand that there are many other sources of aerial violence, including the Pakistan Air Force, that's Mir Ali in North Waziristan in early 2015. But my focus today is going to be on Afghanistan. Afghanistan, which we know remains the most drone-bombed country in the world. 
And there too, of course, drones have been used to carry out targeted killing. This slide from The Intercept which shows a targeted killing carried out by an MQ-9 Reaper. But even there we need to understand that targeted killings are carried out from other aerial platforms too. Here in Afghanistan a targeted killing carried out by a combat attack helicopter. If we look at the air wars over Afghanistan more generally, what we find is that at the height of the air wars in 2009, uh, 2010, 2011, drone strikes were responsible for just 5 to 6 percent of all airstrikes. Now that's immensely important because it seems to me even as we worry away about, and with good reason, the lethal power of the drone, it's immensely important to worry away too about all those other forms of aerial violence. And I'm shocked and dismayed that so few people seem to register that and even care about it. Now since then the proportion of strikes carried out from remote platforms in Afghanistan has increased, coinciding with the US drawdown of its forces. 56% in 2015. But as you can see, during that year far fewer weapons overall were released, bombs and missiles. But even that understates the significance of the drone, because we know that they are involved through their full motion video feeds in providing intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance for many of those other strikes carried out by conventional strike aircraft. We know too, thanks to the wonderful work of Larry Lewis, that at a particular moment in time, as it happens the moment in time I'm going to be looking at in just a moment, whenever drones were used to execute a target, not simply to provide intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance, but to launch Hellfire missiles, they were responsible for ten times more civilian casualties, or more accurately, they were more likely, ten times more likely, to cause civilian casualties than those manned platforms. Now all of that is backdrop to what I want to talk about, which is one very particular airstrike. It's an airstrike with which I'm sure you are all familiar. It was an airstrike carried out in February 2010 on three vehicles travelling through a dusty mountain pass in Uruzgan province. It was widely reported across the New York Times, The Guardian and beyond. Those who called in the strike believed that this was a Taliban convoy threatening a US Special Forces joined Afghan forces counterinsurgency operation on the ground. When the smoke cleared, when the troops arrived at the engagement site, they found between 15 and 23 people killed, all civilians, mostly Hazaras travelling together for security through Taliban country. Now this strike has been written about endlessly. It opens Grégoire Chamillou's theory of the drone. It opens Andrew Coburn's kill chain. This then appears to be the signature strike of drone warfare. And yet it has a very particular significance for three reasons. The first is that this strike seemed to fly in the face of a whole series of attempts to minimise civilian casualties, a series of tactical directives issued by coalition forces in Afghanistan designed to limit civilian casualties. Each intervention was, as it happened, a response to an air-to-ground strike to a situation of so-called troops in contact. So what went wrong? Why wasn't that tactical directive respected? Secondly, we need to remind ourselves that this attack was not carried out by a drone. It relied on intelligence from an MQ-1 predator, but it was in fact carried out by two attack helicopters. This was a strategy known as close combat attack, not close air support. It can be traced back to Korea, but in Afghanistan it came into its own as an attempt precisely to limit civilian casualties. The basic idea was that helicopters could come in low and slow, that they could identify the target with a precision denied to the Air Force's fast movers. And of course that notion of low and slow echoes the persistent presence of the predator, also supposedly providing that detailed 
view of the targets. But the third reason that it's attracted so much attention we owe to an extraordinary journalist, David Cloud, writing in the LA Times, who based, I think, a truly brilliant reconstruction of that strike on a transcript of internal crew communications at Creech Air Force Base in Nevada and the radio communications between that Predator crew and the US Special Forces on the ground. I have no idea where that transcript came from. I can tell you that it was not released to the LA Times under a Freedom of Information Act request, and it did not originate from the US Air Force, from US Central Command, or from US Special Operations Command. What's more, that transcript reappears in the official investigation into the strike. A 2,000-page file which was released under a Freedom of Information Act request to the American Civil Liberties Union. And if you look at that file, you will find that transcript, except that you won't. You will find a transcript that begins two hours later and which has been redacted differently. So when you put the two together, all kinds of gaps start to be plugged. The conclusion of that army investigation was, among others, that the Predator crew displayed a chronic and persistent desire to strike, and that they were very largely responsible for what transpired. And that too was the conclusion of David Cloud. It was also the conclusion of Andrew Coburn, of Grégoire Chamayou, and virtually everybody who's written about that airstrike. The claim was put into these extraordinary words by a young Air Force captain at Creech Air Force Base that everyone around here, it's like Top Gun. Everyone has the desire to do our job, employ weapons against the enemy. They were thinking, hell yeah, we want to help out and be part of this. But when you look at the full file, when you put that transcript alongside the investigation and all its interviews and its attendant material, I think a more complicated story emerges, one which has a lot to say about remote operations. <coughs> now, the file is incomplete in all sorts of ways. Bizarrely, all sorts of people were not interviewed, or if they were, those interviews have been removed from the file, I think largely as a result of poor collation in response to the FOIA request. The transcript itself is incomplete because, crucially, it provides no record of chat, of Merck communications, that's um, internet relay chat, which is vital. It's the nuts and bolts of US military operations because it's multidimensional. It allows for multiple actors in the same space. But some of those conversations can be recovered from the full investigation file. Now, there's much more I could say about the raw material that I'm using, but let's move to the strike itself. The story begins on the 21st of February 2010, when a US Special Forces detachment lifted off, along with the forward attack controller assigned to them, known as a JTAC, along with Afghan forces from the Afghan National Army and the Afghan National Police. Their objective was a small village, Khod, a short 10 minute, 20 kilometer flight away to the north. Their mission was to search for an IED factory. We need to remind ourselves, perhaps, that this was a war zone, that IEDs were responsible for a growing toll of casualties, both military but overwhelmingly civilian, and that the situation by the end of 2009 was critical. It's also likely that the mission had a very special significance for those US Special Forces, because the base from which they operated had been known as Firebase Cobra, until it was renamed Firebase Tinsley in honour of that man on the right, a Special Forces captain who died there in August 2009 from wounds sustained when an IED exploded 
next to his patrol vehicle. That combined force took off in three giant Chinook helicopters flown by Special Operations Command. They were only allowed to fly at night. And yet that mission was only authorized to take place during the day, which meant that when those troops arrived at COD, they had to sit and wait until dawn. As they waited, they turned their radios to scan. Those radios were used for inter-team communication, but they could also scan radio communications. And very early on, they started to pick up messages known as ICOM, intercepted communications from the Taliban, preparing for an attack. They passed the frequencies to an AC-130 gunship, also flown by Special Operations Command, which had come down from Bagram Airfield to support the Chinook helicopters into COD. It was now circling over the village. On board the AC-130 is a sophisticated battle management centre and a certified army linguist. So they too could eavesdrop. But in addition, there was also an NSA forward deployed cell, the National Security Agency, which unlike those scanning radios, unlike the battle management centre, could, using a device on the predator known as an air handler, geolocate the source of those radio transmissions. And throughout that long night and on into the morning, there were persistent attempts to correlate the video feeds from the aircraft with the intercepted ICOM chatter. It wasn't long before one of the special forces parties to the south of the village, establishing a fire position, looked up the valley and saw headlights flashing. The JTAC, the forward air controller on the ground with the special forces, asked the AC-130 to fly north and locate the source of those headlights. Looking through the infrared sensors on board the AC-130, it appeared to be trucks full of hotspots, he said. He radioed the JTAC, there appears to be unlawful personnel in the back. The JTAC, alarmed by intercepted communications, the radio chatter amongst the Taliban, fearful of being encircled, asked the AC-130 to engage those trucks with what he called containment fires. That's not a direct assault, that's simply an attempt to force the vehicles to stop or divert. But suddenly the flight commander is less gung-ho about what's happening. He asks whether the Predator, also circling over the village in support of the mission, could go and take a look. The JTAC agrees, but he says, we'd really like to take out those trucks. Now the Predator had taken off from Kandahar airfield, it was controlled by a crew there, but once it was airborne, control passed to the ground control station at Creech Air Force Base outside Las Vegas. It's Full motion video signals were transmitted via a Q-band satellite down to the satellite portal at Ramstein Air Base in Germany, across the Atlantic by fiber optic cable to the ground control station. And from there, that imagery is distributed through a series of networks. Now those two aircraft, the AC-130 and the Predator, were extraordinarily important because they extended the direct field of vision of the special forces on the ground. They could see things the people on the ground could not. And yet their contribution was limited in two main ways. Firstly, the image quality, including the full motion video feed from the Predator, was variable and never crystal clear, affected by atmospheric conditions, by focusing difficulties, and most of all by data compression because of bandwidth constraints. Even the trained video screeners scrutinizing that, f that feed at Hurlbut Field in Florida, again another wing of Special Operations Command, were frustrated by the quality of the feed that they were receiving. The image quality was also compromised by the indeterminacy of infrared. As that same young captain I cited earlier at Creech told the investigating team, it's not like you're staring from me to you across the room. I can give a detailed description. They had been following all night, and using IR, it's just black and white, 
and hot and cold. But even more important, the image quality was compromised by the narrow field of view. That same young captain said that we don't pass any information from the predator to the forces on the ground about the passengers because we don't know ourselves. We're looking through a soda straw at it. He was part right and part wrong. They were indeed looking through a soda straw, but as we will see, they did repeatedly pass information. Now, one of the survivors of that strike, shown here from Sonia Kennebec's reconstruction in the documentary National Bird, asks, didn't you see that there were women and children in the truck and the two SUVs? But no, they didn't. There were many reasons that they didn't, but one of them was that very early on in the process, the young sergeant controlling the multispectral targeting system on the Predator, because of the narrow field of view, decided to focus on the lead vehicle, a pickup truck. That was the only vehicle that they could bring into focus. And as it happens, the occupants of that lead vehicle, a truck, most of them jam jammed in the back and exposed to the aerial gaze, were all men. The passengers in the two vehicles they didn't scrutinise included women and children. When you explore the dialogue amongst the crew of the Predator scrutinising the screen, what is extraordinary about it is that the most sustained discussions are not about the occupants of the vehicles at all. They're about the vehicles themselves. These are simply some examples. Is it a Suzuki? Like a Trooper? Well, it looks like a Jeep. Well, like a Tahoe or like an extended Zuki. That looks like a Toyota. That vehicle here, the more I look at it, it resembles a Ford Explorer. Now, the reason that they talk about the vehicles is not only because they could see them more clearly than the occupants, it was surely because they were familiar to American eyes in the way that Afghan people were not. So in all those ways then, that prosthetic effect of the Predator in particular was limited by the quality and the frame of view. But it was limited even more because those forces on the ground had no laptop which ordinarily would have enabled them to receive directly the video feed from the Predator. It also prevented them from having any access to all of that chatter amongst all of the people watching the feed online. And so as a result, they were wholly dependent on the ability of the pilot flying the Predator to paint a verbal picture, picture. That becomes all the more important when you remember that what they're looking at on their screens is a silent movie. Nasser Hussein puts it wonderfully well when he describes this mute world of dumb figures moving about on a screen. So how do we animate that silent movie? Well, remember the ICOM, the intercepted radio communications? That was used to add some subtitles, but the only direct sound from the ground was the JTAC's voice and any ambient noise picked up by his microphone. Most of the subtitles, most of the ventriloquization of what those occupants were doing was provided by the Predator crew watching the feed. Let me give you some examples of how they did it. In order to engage those vehicles, which increasingly as the night wears on, the special forces on the ground see as a threat, all sorts of criteria had to be satisfied. One of them was tactical manoeuvring, which is movement to gain tactical advantage. When the Predator pilot was questioned about how he understood tactical manoeuvring, a phrase which he used repeatedly to describe what he was seeing on the screen, he said, well, it means people are moving tactically. Now, you can see the eyebrows of the investigating officers raise at that less than helpful definition. 
So prodded to clarify, he says this, moving tactically as opposed to moving in a random manner that you would expect normal civilians to move or drive. Now think about that. The fact of the matter is they were all normal civilians. So what could they have possibly done differently? Even had they known that they were under surveillance, which would satisfy those eyes behind the screen that those people in front of the screen were indeed normal civilians. Exactly the same thing happened when an American airstrike was called in on the MSF Trauma Center in Kunduz. As the AC-130 circled overhead, the flight commander looked down on the ground and he saw people outside the trauma center, doctors and nurses, perhaps some patients, just sitting, taking in the air. They had no reason to be scared. But when he looked down and saw that they didn't run, well, that's what the Taliban do. They pretend to be normal civilians, acting nonchalantly, whereas any normal civilian would run like hell when an AC-130 comes overhead. The issue here, then, is of performing civilianness, as Christiana Wilke puts it. Now, by quarter past five in the morning, as dawn is approaching, the JTAC has decided that the situation is becoming sufficiently threatening that we need to destroy all these vehicles and all the people associated with them. We believe they're bad. But still, the main impetus for this is coming not from the Predator crew, but from the commander of the AC-130 gunship, still circling overhead. We're all set up up here. Stand by your intentions for a fire mission. A quarter of an hour later, we can only give you another three to five minutes without a fire mission. We're right at the outer limit of our fuel level. Until at 5.34, he's forced to sign off reluctantly. And from here on, the Predator crew are the primary eyes in the sky. And from here on, those verbal descriptions which they provide to the special forces on the ground become more and more prejudicial. Up to this point, they've described them as people, passengers, guys. But from 534, they become military-aged males, part of what Jamie Allenson calls a necropolitical logic. The trucks soon become a convoy. The trucks themselves described as the sort of vehicles the Taliban use. They search diligently for weapons because that's one of the other things you need to authorise an airstrike. They have immense difficulty in seeing them. When the pilot is questioned during the army investigation, he says, oh, there must have been hundreds of times when we saw weapons. He eventually concedes that maybe there were 30. And then when he's pressed further, he admits that there were only one or two calls of weapons. But the reason that they didn't call weapons more frequently was because they were being deliberately concealed. So what you see is an artful pattern of turning negatives into positives. The fact that you can't see weapons is not a sign of innocence. It's a sign of guilt because they're concealing them from the eyes in the sky. They wrap the shit up in their man dresses so you can't PID it. Now, of course, that's an Orientalist slur and it's deeply objectionable, but don't let it distract you from the fact that what's being said there is the fact that you can't see weapons is a sign of guilt, not innocence. The JTAC asks them to look for mortar tubes. We'll keep our eyes open, but we haven't seen it yet. And there's a world of meaning in that dangling yet. And on and on. As the picture builds, as the forces on the ground get more and more alarmed, so they decide to call what's called an air tick. This is a precautionary measure. Tick normally means troops in contact. It would dispatch strike aircraft to come to the aid of ground forces who are exchanging fire with the Taliban. This is purely, this is, uh, purely a precautionary measure. They're told that a scout weapons team, two armed reconnaissance helicopters from Ta Task Force Wolfpack, will come to their aid and maybe 
some AH-10 warthogs. These are strike aircraft, but unlike the fast movers, they travel low and slow, have extraordinary all-round visibility, and are designed for close air support, unlike the fast movers. So we know that at least the helicopters are on the way, and at that point, the people in the vehicles, as dawn comes up, stop to pray. And immediately that's seized upon, not as something which any devout Muslim would do at the beginning of the day, but that's what the Taliban do. They're praying, they're praying. Praying, I mean, seriously, that's what they do, meaning the Taliban. They're going to do something nefarious. When they finished praying, another radio message reaches the forces on the ground to say that in addition to the helicopters, those other support aircraft are now on station. So the forward air controller brings the Predator down to deconflict the airspace to make room for what they all think is going to be an A-10 Warthog. It's supposed to hold south in order not to burn the target, in order not to alert the occupants of the vehicles that there were more aircraft in the sky. Suddenly, roaring overhead, a two F-15 Strike Eagle jets. They travel at Mark 3.5. There's a sonic boom. The ground force commander is furious, picks up the phone and calls the command post above him to insist that they be called off because they've burned the target. And at that precise moment, the vehicles change direction of movement. They move Suddenly, they're no longer coming down towards COD, they move off in this direction. And that is seen as a deliberate and guilty response to the aircraft overhead. And this is where those chats, the text messages, become so important. So we know, I know, through Merck, that one of those video analysts looking at the screen says, it's not a flanking manoeuvre, they're evading. They've turned round, they're going away. The mission intelligence controller at Cre Creech dismisses it. They may be flanking, it's too soon to tell. She comes back, too far away from coalition forces at COD to be flanking. Ah, says the mission intelligence coordinator, they were spooked earlier by the two F-15s. And those messages from the primary Greeners, the video analysts scrutinising that feed, were never forwarded by the Predator crew to the forces on the ground. And so not surprisingly, they assumed that this was a flanking manoeuvre. That's how the Predator crew described it. Now things start to get even more complicated because in addition to these operations on the ground and in the air, they're being observed from two Special Forces command posts, immediately above those special forces on the ground, Special Operations Task Force South at Kandahar Airfield, and then above them, the Combined Joint Special Operations Task Force at Bagram Airfield. But for the moment, the focus is on Kandahar, where throughout the night, a so-called battle captain who's in charge of the operations centre has been monitoring a stream of reports coming from those forces on the ground. I just monitored, he said, and saw what happened. I didn't feel it was necessary to wake anyone. He was green, he'd been in post for three weeks. His superior officers knew that he was barely adequate and he didn't know what he was doing. Despite all that ICOM chatter about the Taliban planning a, an attack, preparing to encircle the ground forces, despite the AC-130 gunship going off station because it was out of fuel, despite the ground force commander calling an air tick, that precautionary measure, he didn't wake anybody. And in fact, his operations log at the operations centre falls silent for two hours. There are no entries. But then, sometime between 7.30, 7.45 in the morning, the shift changes. A much more experienced day battle captain takes over, and he's thoroughly, thoroughly alarmed by what he sees. He's not convinced that this is a hostile force, still less that it's a legitimate military target. So he runs over and wakes up the military lawyer 
from the Judge Advocate General's Corps, known as a JAG, and asks him for advice. He hurries over to the operations centre, clutching that stream of supports which had been typed up from the forces on the ground. He's got with him, as it happens, a copy of the tactical directive. So he knows exactly what is and is not allowed. He rushes in, he sees the predator feed. And from everything that he knows, there's no legitimate reason for an airstrike to be called. While that's taking place in Kandahar, north at Bagram, Colonel Gus Benton, who had been woken up for the first time in three years in Afghanistan in the middle of the night, to be alerted to what was happening, eventually arrives in his operations centre, sizes things up in a glance, as you will see in just a moment, and his second-in-command tries to reassure him that what the forces on the ground are doing in COD is waiting for those vehicles to get close. And once they get close, once it's clear they're a threat formation, he'll engage. That's what we always did, he said, when I was out in the field. That's just great. To which Benton says, that's not fucking great. And he stormed out, picked up the phone, and rang down to Kandahar. And he wanted to know why those vehicles had not been destroyed. Now, when he's questioned about his enthusiasm for taking out those vehicles, he said that when he was woken up in the middle of the night, those vehicles were five, six miles away sorry, five, six kilometres away, and he'd just assumed that by the time he got to the operations centre, given the time that had elapsed, obviously they were closer. So they pressed him on that. How did you know it was closer? Did you look at a map? Well, no, I looked at the predator feed. What did the predator feed tell you? Well, it showed vehicles moving on a road, and it was open country, so there was no danger of civilian casualties if we took the convoy out. He's forgetting the fact that there might be civilians in the convoy, but there are no residential compounds around about, no villages, no towns, it's open country, let's go for it. Pressed, he says, well, there's no way for me to know which way those vehicles are moving. And the investigation team say to him, well, actually, you see that little arrow at the bottom corner of the predator feed? That indicates the direction of tracked movement. Oh, OK, well, I missed that. They then explain the reason we're asking is that had you bothered to check all that, you would have discovered that those vehicles were not only further away from forces on the ground than when they'd first been seen, but they were moving away. Oh, I'll take a hit on that, he said, in the circumstances, a spectacularly inappropriate choice of words. But then he rallies to say it really doesn't matter how far away they were. I would have pulled a trigger on a dynamic target thousands of kilometres away. Well, the only people that would do that, as a matter of fact, would be a predator crew at Creech Air Force Base in Nevada, not forces on the ground in Afghanistan. How far away were they? Well, that young military lawyer asked that as his first question when he arrived at the operations centre in Kandahar. How far away are they? They measured it, 12.8 kilometres. How does that translate into time? Well, it depends who you ask. The helicopter pilots thought three hours from there to get to COD. The fires officer at Kandahar thought, well, 35 to 45 minutes. The ground force commander, though, with the special forces on the ground, thought that it was going to be 15 to 20 minutes. But remember, the screener at Herbert Field in Florida had already said that not only were they further away, they were not heading in the direction of COD at all. Now, of course, when the phone rings in Kandahar, and it's an irate Colonel Benton screaming down the phone, wanting to know why those vehicles hadn't been taken out, the commander at Kandahar is also woken up, immensely ticked off, as he puts it, that he'd been brought in so late in the game. He was in a state of near panic. But then... After he was told how far away those vehicles were from COD, after he had been told by the lawyer that there was no legitimate grounds for an airstrike, and after he was assured that those helicopters that had been called to come to the aid of the forces on the ground were off station refuelling, he thought they had time 
to activate a completely different course of action. It's called an aerial vehicle interdiction, in which other helicopters come in, force the vehicles to stop, hopefully without a shot being fired, and find out what's going on. In fact, at that moment, the phone rings. It's another team with helicopters who've been watching the Predator feed. They read the situation in exactly the same way. They're not convinced that this is a Taliban convoy, and they offer their helicopters to carry out the aerial vehicle interdiction. Meanwhile, the Predator crew back in Nevada are busy watching the feed. Oh, sweet target, says the sensor operator. By now, though, the ground force commander, completely unaware of Benton's phone call and support, completely unaware of what's taking place at Kandahar and the fact that they're planning an altogether different course of action, is thoroughly alarmed. He receives reports from the outer checkpoints of his cordon that women and children are leaving their villages and pushing to open ground, which is a surefire signal of an impending attack. He then tells the Predator crew that they've received special intelligence that the Northern Group, which he assumes are those three vehicles, is trying to link up with another fighting force coming from the South, and that they will completely encircle his forces and ultimately cut off their line of retreat. So at some time between 8.20 and 8.30, he sends a report up to Kandahar telling them he's going to clear the helicopters to engage on the grounds of an imminent threat to coalition forces. There's no record of that report because all of those reports made available end at 6.50 in the morning and no explanation is ever given. So the helicopters are now called forward to attack. The original sensor operator controlling that ball in the Predator is due for an hour's break at 8.30, so his place is taken by a new sensor operator at 8.30 who's there for the rest of the engagement. He's just as gung-ho as his predecessor, terribly excited at the prospect of a strike. The Predator crew talk the helicopters onto the target. The Predator was the main source of all the information we got, said one of the helicopter pilots. But they confessed that they couldn't really make out the composition of the occupants of the vehicles using their sensors, because just like the Predator, theirs are infrared. It's all green and black. That's the view from one of their mast-mounted sites. Ideally, they say, we'd go in low and slow, and we would be able to see with our naked eyes who those people are. But we've been warned off. We've been told not to burn the target. And we've also been told that all these weapons have been identified. So they're a clear and present danger to us. So we pull back and we rely on what the Predator says. They're identified. They're ready to go in for the shot. But the Predator crew is immensely excited because they think that once the helicopters have taken out the vehicles, the Predator has one Hellfire missile left. And they can use that to take out the remaining survivors. So the helicopters are cleared for attack by the forward air controller on the ground. Engaging, good hit, we're turning out right, good hit. There is the predator feed of that hit. Everyone who testified from the operations center in Kandahar claimed to be astonished. Their first thought was that that lead vehicle, which was the first one to be struck by, as it happened, a Hellfire missile from their lead helicopter, they assumed, ironically, that it had been hit by an IED. Instead, the lead vehicle and the trail vehicle were hit by K2A Hellfire missiles, which have a blast fragmentation sleeve specifically for use against non-armoured vehicles. It generates an expanding sphere of fragments that flies out at high speed to shred the target within a contained radius of around 20 metres. The middle vehicle was hit by a laser-guided N Hellfire missile. This fragmentation sleeve is augmented by a thermobaric warhead that kills by sucking the air out of a confined space. Fortunately, it missed. But they followed up using 70mm folding fin rockets on the survivors who bailed from the vehicles. 
They have a blast fragmentation radius of 10 meters and a lethal fragmentation radius of 50 meters. These were catastrophic hits. If we look at National Bird, we can recover what the experience was like. One of the young survivors drew a series of pictures showing the effects of the strike. His mother, travelling in the middle vehicle, says we were horrified and panicked. The vehicle stopped and we got out. Then they hit the vehicle behind us. The men said the women should get out of the car. There were two black helicopters and a white plane. That's the predator that made a bing sound. It was hovering above us. My husband had him, that's Surab, the little boy on the right there, on his chest and was trying to get him and my daughter out of the car. When it stopped, my husband tried to get the children out. Now the survivor said that when the vehicle was hit, the ladies came out from the other vehicles crying and screaming, running towards the road crying, yelling and screaming. I couldn't see anything because my face was covered with blood. When one of the men regained consciousness, he could see that our vehicles were wrecked, the injured were everywhere. I saw someone who was headless and someone else cut in half. Now the survivor said that he saw pieces of bodies like the size of this cup. And suddenly at that moment, the Predator crew watching all this on their screens realize that this is weird. They'd expected to play what they call squirter patrol, going after those who escaped the vehicles, because they expected the Taliban to run. But repeatedly they say, this is weird. They're not running. They're just walking away. I don't know about this. This is weird. Got nowhere to go. The thing is, nobody run. Yeah, that was weird. And the mission commander of those screeners at Hurlbut Field confirmed that the reaction of the survivors was different than is normal during an engagement with the Taliban. So the only time at which their civilianness flickered into view was after the attack, not before. That was the only moment when they were able to perform civilianness to the satisfaction of those behind the screen. But even that didn't daunt the Predator pilot. This is redacted from the LA Times transcript. But he's busy in the middle of all this carnage setting up for another shot. It's going to be people out in the open. It'll be shoot and press, papa sleeve off the left-hand slide side. That's the Hellfire missile, ready to fire. And yet now the helicopter pilots start to report colour. Throughout the engagement, not only have they been relying on their infrared sensors, but the relief sensor operator has switched back to infrared for the Predator view. But once the predator pilots, as they're climbing, once the helicopter pilots, excuse me, are climbing above the carnage, they can see with their own eyes colour. They think that might be women. So the predator crew switch back to colour. They still don't believe that these are civilians. So they make a series of crude, coarse, callous jokes about those people who, remember, are not running, their civilianness momentarily suspended, until one of the screeners says they're calling females. And the relief sensor operator says, I personally wouldn't be comfortable at shooting those people. That lady's carrying a kid. Maybe, says the predator pilot. Yes, says the mission intelligence coordinator, the baby on the right. Right there, says the relief sensor operator in the crosshairs. So as Joe Pugliese says, the occupants of those vehicles, all civilians, only become civilian after the event. Now, I'm conscious of time, so I won't pursue the analysis of those bodies on the ground. I won't pursue what happens when those special forces are flown four hours later to the engagement site. That's four hours without medical attention. When they search the site because they think it's a crime scene, they still are hanging on to the hope that this is the Taliban. And so they carry out a forensic exercise looking for weapons. They're convinced that this so-called crime scene has been tampered with. The bodies in that four-hour gap had been lined up 
covered. Somebody else was on the scene prior to us, contaminating the scene. But eventually, those bodies are removed from the military gaze and returned to their village. We have cell phone video from the survivors of those bodies going back to the village. Those who survived were airlifted by uh, US military helicopters and en route medical technicians reduced those living bodies as they would, I have to say, military bodies to notations on a screen. Many of those that were treated there had suffered life-changing and in some cases life-threatening injuries. But the most important person that I want to tell you about is that little boy. And this is where I will end. The first thing this army investigation team did was visit the survivors in hospital before they spoke to anybody else. And one of the military doctors caring for the survivors says, this is the kid that lost the leg, the left leg. That's the kid that lost the leg, the left leg. That's Surab, and there is his family. They were filmed by Sonia Kennebec in Kabul because they had made a long journey to Kabul, retracing, re-traumatising themselves through exactly the same journey that they'd undertaken on that fateful day so that Surab could receive a new prosthesis. All of this took place outside the army and military medical system because the rules of eligibility say that as soon as life-saving, limb-saving, eye-saving surgery has been conducted, people should be removed from the military system to the so-called Afghan system. Fortunately, that's supplemented by organisations like Médecins Sans Frontières and the International Committee of the Red Cross. And there, at that orthopaedic centre, there are endless files of men, women, boys, girls, people like Surab, who have to be fitted with prostheses. And, as Kennebec shows, that's just a selection. And most of them, to go right back to where we started, are victims of IEDs. Thanks very much. start off with it just about because you end up with prosthesis and you, know, you use the word before about prosthetics of the, the mediated technology of the screens and everything so, mm -hmm. well uh, two things to say really one is that one of the issues that we all need to come to terms with i think is the distance over which military violence is enacted Because distance, it seems to me, cannot be a moral absolute. If you think it's wrong to kill somebody from seven and a half thousand miles away, perhaps you could tell me over what distance you think it is acceptable to kill somebody. And as I tried to show you throughout this, the meaning of distance constantly changed. The aircraft did act as prostheses. They greatly extended the visual range of those special forces on the ground. But yet what that distance meant in terms of time change dramatically depending on who you were talking to. So, so much of later modern war depends upon distance technology. Now, of course, drones are one of the leading edges of that. But the fact of the matter is, as I've also tried to show you, there are these elaborate networks of command and control, which of course have rolled in those feeds from the predators, but they're not limited to them. There are many other sources. Um, and so this networked war is in fact remarkably creaky. It's not very robust. It's constantly breaking down. The feeds freeze, collapse, and this prosthetic vision is, is <coughs> so much more and so much less than a purely technical capacity. But the reason I end with this um, image is, is two reasons. Firstly, I think that in some of the commentaries I've read on this airstrike, 
They read as though these were three vehicles out for a Sunday drive in Warwickshire. And we do need to understand that this was a war zone and that people there were menaced by foreign military forces and by the Taliban. And therefore that many of those people who were living and surviving in that landscape, soldiers and civilians alike, were constantly alert for threats. That's why these vehicles were travelling together, partly because if they broke down they could help one another, but partly because they were Hazaras, terrified of the Taliban, which had carried out three massacres of uh, the Hazaras in living memory. They were aware that this was a threat landscape. Equally, if we look at the briefing maps, which I didn't have time to go through, but if we look at the briefing maps given to the helicopter pilots, the maps of SIG acts of um, significant military activities, for example, you can see that there's a kind of aerial essentialism at work. Nobody, the pilot of the AC-130 and his crew, the helicopter pilots, um, the predator crew at, at Creech, they're all aware that this is a threat landscape. But what then comes into play is a kind of aerial essentialism in which you assume that everything you see is hostile because the people moving in that landscape are reduced to that threat landscape unless they give you evidence otherwise. Now the fact is that international humanitarian law works the other way round. You're supposed to presume they're civilian unless you have good reason to suppose otherwise. But that aerial essentialism appears again and again and again. And it's important to understand too that that registers long before the predator crew open their mouths. Those special forces on the ground insist that this is a known bad guy area. The last time they were there, five of them were wounded. That was the previous year on their previous rotation. The um, AC-130 gunship, you can read the commander's um, testimony. It's clear he was hungry for releasing uh, weapons long before the Predator crew were on station. So there's this elaborate collaborative construction of a threat formation. It's not just the Predator crew, and that's the other reason why I think these remote operations need to be embedded in the larger matrix of military violence. But I end with this, finally, because the work I'm doing at the moment isn't about this at all. Um, it's about um, evacuation from war zones of civilians and soldiers. And I wanted just to be able to tell you that. <laughs> that I've got tired of the killing and I've tried to turn the other cheek. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, so I wanted to um, think with you and, and ask you um, if you could speak on the role of responsibility here, um, which seems to be, or accountability, um, which is a kind of hypothetical question that had posed to me. If, if we were going to hold someone accountable for these for these targeting killings, who would it be? Yep. Especially speaking about this kind of decentralized authority, <clears throat> this whole chain model, and of course the remoteness aspect of it. Um, and also, as you highlighted so many times, there's so many factors that can't be controlled that are manipulating our vision and our perception. Yeah. Here. That's a really, really good question. Now, um, let me take it in, in three parts. If, if we look at the situation that I've described, clearly responsibility is dispersed through the kill chain, so it ends up being an incredibly complicated network. And what's so very artful about that is that once everybody is responsible, nobody is, right? And that doesn't simply hold for these operations. It holds for, you know, um, RAF Bomber Command flying over um, German cities in the Second World War. When you add in all of the people that were involved in producing a target, because after all, we don't live in a world of targets. Targets have to be produced. That's a very active process. Um, so that's the first point. You're absolutely right that responsibility is dispersed. The second point is that in this case, um, the investigation did assign blame. So um, three field officers and three staff officers, staff officers were reprimanded. In two cases, those were career-ending reprimands. Um, the ground force commander was reprimanded. Um, the finding was that he had good reason to believe that his forces were facing an imminent threat, but he should have taken greater care to find more information, which would have um, 
changed his assessment. Now, the difficulty there is that all the people in those command posts, once the strike went down, the people with more information, with legal advice, for example, with the plan for an AVI, assumed that he had information that they didn't have, which is why he pulled the trigger. Whereas, in fact, it was entirely the other way round. They had information he didn't and should have given it to him. But the third thing I want to say is this, and I say this very tentatively. Um, throughout the investigation, the power of international humanitarian law was consistently invoked. And remember that that is a remarkably conditional power in the sense that it's not an unconditional protection for civilians. You are allowed to kill civilians as long as you do so deliberately but incidentally. You're not aiming at civilians, but if there are civilians on a legitimate military target, if the tragedy of their death is outweighed by direct and concrete military advantage, it's perfectly acceptable. Now, much of the discussion centered on whether this was a legitimate military target, and that involved, uh, among other things, tactical maneuvering, the presence of weapons, and um, so on. But what I find interesting about this is that and again, there may be people here, I'm sure there are, who know much more about this than I do. But if you are accused of a war crime under international humanitarian law, in which people are killed, you are guilty or you're not. And in this particular case, and in all cases like it, there is no equivalent to the charge of manslaughter under civilian law. This is not a violation of international humanitarian law because they did not know, because they did not deliberately kill civilians. But the fact of the matter is, at the end of the day, they did. And the kind of responsibility, as far as I understand it anyway, the kind of responsibility that international humanitarian law ought to place on their souls shoulders is absolute. Effectively in civil terms, murder or not. You either intended to or you didn't. Right? And that seems to me to weigh very heavily in this case. There are um, crimes under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, including culpable homicide, which is the closest you get to manslaughter, but that was never considered um, in this case. But the third option could be the state of exception. Well, it could, except, well, there, there are two things to say about that. I mean, uh, that, that's another long lecture. Um, <laughs> but crucially, what I want to say is, is that most of what a government has to say about the state of exception, in my view, is misplaced and wrong. Um, it's misplaced and wrong, firstly, because he wants to limit the space of exception to the camp and to that enclosed space. And yes, and spaces of exception clearly originate long before that. Even if we talk about Auschwitz, the space of exception is present as soon as you start putting stars on people and rounding them up into ghettos and putting them on trains. But even more important, another space in which people are deliberately and knowingly exposed to death by the suspension of legal protections is, of course, the war zone. And that's precisely what Agamben never addresses. And he never addresses, therefore, the role of international humanitarian law in providing that limited protection for civilians. So that's a, that's a yeah. vital you're question. Also, you're basically you know, building enclosures anyway, turning them into camps. Even battle spears are turned into enclosures anyway. So again, you can just relate it to the state of exception, not just to camps, but to such situations as well. Yeah, well, you can. Um, depending on how absolute you want those enclosures to be. I mean, I've done a lot of work on the space of exception in Syria and what happens behind siege lines when the Syrian army throws a, a cordon um, uh, around a community and then the Russian and the Syrian air force descend um, with, with rockets and bombs. That's clearly, if you like, a version of the camp. But here, after all, you've got you know, an entire country and then you've got that very complicated relationship, which I didn't go into, between the space of exception which obtains in Afghanistan as a war zone and the space of exception which obtains alongside in the federally administered tribal areas. And there, that space of exception is produced not just by um, international humanitarian law and by um, 
US foreign policy, but it's also produced through the active connivance of the Pakistani government. So all I'm trying to say really is, is, is that the legal armature that surrounds this is incredibly complicated. It's not absolute. And there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's an immensely intricate legal geography which is being danced to enable this military violence to take place, not just from the air, but also, of course, uh, on the ground. Thank you. Very, very insightful, um, um, the way that you've just deconstructed every moment. I wonder if you could say something just briefly about, you've mentioned distance about time. Um, over what period of time did this happen? It seems in the, <coughs> in the talk it was days or weeks, but I suspect it's much quicker. And there's another part of time as well that I'm curious is, not only did it seem more and more people were entering the kill chain, entering the space at different times and things, but it also seemed like that there was this ticking clock that had been put on the threat, and rather than pulling back or evacuating, that there was some sort of test time test that was mm -hmm. arbitrarily put on these civilians as well. So. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question as well, um, and equally difficult. Um, <laughs> Well, OK, let me start here. Um, Chris Cole had this wonderful interview with a former British Reaper pilot who said that one of the great things about flying a Reaper is that you own time, essentially. That we're not like these fast movers that, that uh, elsewhere in, in, in the Air Force that come roaring in at high speed, drop their bombs, barely seeing the target. In fact, they don't have to because they're flying so fast they can't. It's all driven by, by algorithms and by machines and, and by screens. But we're not like that. We can slow everything down. We own time. And I have, I didn't talk about it today, but the commanding officer of the squadron from which the Predator came, um, uh, the 15th Air Reconnaissance Squadron at, at Creech, says exactly the same. We own time. Unlike all these guys who just turn up, drop their bombs and zip out again, we know what we're doing. We know exactly what we're doing. Well, in this case, they didn't. They didn't own time. You know, they were watching for three and a half hours. And at every turn, they got it wrong. Right? At every single conceivable turn, they got it wrong. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that all the time the vehicles are getting closer and closer and closer to COD, you're right, the time is ticking down. The real question is, why does that time accelerate when they turn away? Right? And... Um, the interpretive momentum does get ratcheted up because Colonel Benton staggers over from what he calls his hooch, I think he still thinks he's in Vietnam, um, and starts screaming that they haven't taken those vehicles out. He phones down to Canada, why haven't you done it now? Quickly, now, do it, you know? Um, and this all happens in the space of that. In, 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 in a, within, within the space of about 30 minutes. I mean, 8.20, 8.30, he claims he tells the people at Kandahar, this is going to go down. They have no record of that message whatsoever because they're busy doing something else. Suddenly they look up at the screen and they see the vehicle explode. Um, but the issue there is, is, that, is that that time is never just time. It's also space. And that's why I tried to say that, you see, there, there are two things going on. The justification for the strike is what's called imminent attack. And repeatedly, the investigation team press all those concerns about what does imminence mean to you? Now, actually, in the American context, that's very difficult because the reason the Obama administration justified all those targeted killings in the federal administered tribal areas was imminent danger. And um, they conceded that that required uh, what, um, what they described as an elongated conception of imminence. And exactly the same is true here. I mean, if those helicopter pilots were right, if it was actually going to take those trucks three to four hours to reach COD, there is no imminence. There is no urgency, especially since they're going the other way. All right. Um, and so all the time there's this intricate gavotte in which people are caught in, in time and space. And at one point, um, the investigating officer, who's an amazing man, Tim McHale, is so utterly exasperated. And the thing about reading this, this transcript, I should say, and the inquiry, is that, as I've tried to tell it, I've, I've retained all of the military acronyms, all the military formularies, because I think that abstraction is an important part of how military violence takes place. 
But in the course of the inquiry, you can see that it's not just the voice of military reason. There, my God, there is emotion, there's fear, there's boredom, there's anxiety, there's horror. When the ground force commander sees those bodies on the ground, he literally breaks down at what's happened, at what he's caused to happen. So all of those things play an immensely important part in, in trying to evaluate just how pressing this threat is. Um, but he says to them, what could they possibly have done that would have caused you not to attack them? And the JTAC, the forward air controller, says, oh, that's easy, he said, turn around and gone home. But remember, they didn't know they were being observed. They didn't know they had to act any differently. Since they are civilians, what else could they have done to show that they were civilians? Uh, we, we haven't got any time for uh, any further questions. Maybe some questions can be take place over, over coffee. Mm. Um, just a thank, uh, a huge thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.